Welcome to the Rise of the Challenge podcast. Join me today. He's a Paralympic track and field athlete representing Team Canada, a public speaker, a world champion medalist, and a podcast host. It's Nathan Reich. How are you doing today, Nathan? Good. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Really, I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining. I'm so excited to learn more about you and your Rise to the Challenge. First thing we like to do with all of our guests, we go right to the beginning. Talk about where you're from and what were you involved in growing up? Yeah, so I was originally born in Fresno, California. I was born when my, fan, or when my parents were in college at Fresno State. And so growing up, I basically grew up at the track, to be fully honest with you. Uh, when I was one, my dad went to the Olympics in 1996 uh, yeah, in Athens, and my mom won her national title uh, in Canada in 2000. So I was just really, really s surrounded uh, by that. And when I was three or four, we moved to Arizona, and my stepdad played professional baseball. And so I really just loved baseball for a long time. And Diamondbacks won the World Series in 2001, and we were – I was – right in the middle of all that. So I, I really, really love baseball. And uh, I did not know that my life would be taking a turn. Uh, you know, at the time, I thought it was for the worst. Uh, now I look at it as being the best thing to ever happen to me. But no, I was uh, just my family was, I think we have nine professional athletes in my family. So it was just sports, 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 sports. And that's, uh, that's pretty much how the early days went. Did you have a lot of expectations from your family members to become an athlete and try to live up to what they were able to accomplish? Um, not pressure put on by them. I would say more pressure put on by myself. But recently I reflected on this. Uh, I, wrote, I read a book by Matthew McConaughey called, called Green Lights and really reflected on my parents and um, really, I think my parents were the perfect parents for me uh, personally because they, with my disability, my injury, it was just tough being struck in a golf ball when you're 10 and being paralyzed and going from a normal life to not so much a normal life and just really trying to figure myself out during that time. And so my parents were just, they didn't cut me any slack, which I really, really appreciate it. But at the same time, if I held the door open for someone or if I did something for someone, they, they championed that. And that was something that I'm just so thankful for. They, they instilled uh, so many great uh, at least qualities that I hope I've, I've taken al along the way. And I think anyone who knows me understands character is the most important thing for me personally. And, uh, and that's what my parents have. And so uh, that, that's definitely uh, more of what they <laughs> kind of uh, forced upon me is just um, really allowing me to play different sports and do and do different things and um, not make me do track. I, I kind of didn't want to do track and until that seemed like the only sport that I was interested that I could still play after my track brain injury. So talk about that moment at the age of 10 and what was going on through your through those moments. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, looking back. It's we always joke around that golf's a contact sport now in our family, which is uh, which is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, I was I was going to play golf with a couple of my friends. We were on the all star team together, and I believe we were driving my parents crazy, uh, waiting for the game. And we we're just talking and talking, and so we went to go play. And we were walking. Obviously, we were ten, and uh, older gentlemen, a group group of three. Um, asked to play through and said absolutely it was in Arizona I said why don't we hit our balls and then why don't you stand under the tree about I would say about 200 yards uh, to the left and first shot um, I remember he was using an SQ Nike driver which kind of sounds like a tin trash can when you hit it and then all of a sudden I remember this tingly sensation running through my body and I saw the ball hop in a weird angle and my friend was like Nate you just got hit by that golf ball and I remember my it's almost like pins and needles it it felt like sometimes you get hit so hard by something it's almost numb and pins and needles kind of feeling and everyone asked me did you pass out no I didn't pass out I called my mom my mom thought I was faking it 
because the night before I pitched, uh, I think, a no-hitter or a complete game, and I was complaining about my right arm being sore, and that was the arm that shot down uh, after the impact of the golf ball. And so, yeah, it was uh, my mom decided to drop all of my friends off first um, because she didn't want them to be scared, and she also thought I was maybe faking it. And But as I got to the hospital, my whole right side of my body became paralyzed, or uh, my my lip was droopy. I couldn't, and then I went to jump out of the car when we got to the emergency room and I was dragging my right leg. And I think in that moment, my mom knew something was wrong. I knew something was, wasn't normal, but at that point I still didn't know anything was wrong until we got back into my hospital room and I had a seizure. And a seizure was something that like I've never experienced before. It was, I was trying to talk, I was shaking and I was almost getting frustrated because they weren't hearing me. My mom wasn't hearing me. But then all of a sudden I hear her, I see her bolt out of the room. And I was like, man, like what's going on? And, and I remember just being very confused. I kept throwing this around this word paralyzed. And I guess maybe it's just me being fortunate, being in a great family that no one in my family was paralyzed. And so I didn't really know what that word meant. Um, and I ended up spending a month in the hospital and in my exit interview with the doctor, he said, Nate, you will never walk without a limp. You can bet a sport or not in your future. And for me, that was a crossroad. It was, do I listen to his advice and do I almost uh, ride this smooth road where, you know, success won't come much, but failure won't, won't, won't come much. And I'm just being mediocre life. Or do I really uh, take the risk and try to be the athlete that I always dreamed of? And, but there's going to be a lot of failure there. And there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of low moments. But those low moments make those up moments uh, worth it so much. And so that's kind of um, where my mind was. And <laughs> anyone who knows me knows I'm a bit fiery. So um, it, I was definitely still fiery back then. During the time that you were in the hospital for the month, what was going through your mind? Were you trying to think of, What's, what's next for me if I can't play sports? Or was it just, let's get healthy and just keep on going? Yeah, I think it took so long for me to understand what paralyzed men. I remember because in Arizona, that's where half of the spring training is. And so a bunch of the players would come visit just uh, kids in the hospital and bring bats and stuff like that. And I remember Aaron Boone, who was a really good friend of my stepdad, who they were actually teammates at, at USC. And he sent me a bat and gloves. And I went, my teammates came in. I went to show them. And I remember, or I forgot that I was paralyzed. And my biological dad caught me like that far, like just an inch from the ground uh, because I just totally forgot. And yeah, I, I was... I was so frustrated with everyone. Uh, I had, you know, IVs and cords going through every part of my body. And I mean, every part of my body. And yeah, I was like, why can't I go play baseball? Like, like we have a game. I have to go pitch and we have to win. Like, why am I not playing? And so I think frustration was definitely one of the feelings I felt. And I'm not a very, I've learned patience as I, posted earlier today that's one thing that I've really been trying to learn because I think in this Instagram Twitter world we live in everything's so instant mm -hmm. and you know that's how it's been a majority of my life just in that uh, culture and in that world and so yeah I think that's something that I really had to learn so when after you got out of the hospital did you kind of have that motto never give up and keep going for that athletic um journey yeah uh yeah i definitely did have a philosophy of really i think it's been a good thing and a bad thing i think uh, you almost win on your sword and you die on your sword and uh, i've loved pr pr proving people wrong because i proved my doctors wrong and i'm not gonna lie there's still part of me that wants to prove him wrong and if i'm not having a good day, just training's not going well, or I don't, don't feel like training, I'm unmotivated, which that's very few and far between. Uh, I think of that that talk, and I get goosebumps even just talking about it right now. It, it like replays kind of like in a movie when they do a flashback that's almost what it 
looks like in my head. And yeah, I, I was just there to prove, prove people wrong. And I started really, really bad after I got hurt because my, my speech was uh, affected as well. And I was going into sixth grade. We completely moved while I was in the hospital. So that was, I knew no one, zero people uh, when I went to the first day of school, got out of the hospital on the Saturday, went to school on Monday. That's just who I am and that's who my mom is. She was like, I'm sure she was a bit sick of me and was like, you need to go, you need to go to school. Uh, and I was bullied. I mean, I won't, I mean, I don't think anyone should feel bad for me, but I looked different. I couldn't tie my shoes. I talked different. I couldn't really talk. And yeah, I, there was, uh, I didn't have a lot of friends in those early days. And I'm a very social, I have a, I have a big personality for sure. Like I, I enjoy um, chatting, but I definitely love time with myself as well. And so, you know, when you're 10, 11 years old, you still don't know who you are. And um, so, yeah, it was definitely an interesting uh, journey, you know, of ups and downs through those first three or four years. During this time as you were growing up, did you have any motivations or inspirations, someone that you looked up to, to keep you focused on the path you were taking? Yeah, so obviously um, my parents, but I'll give you a better answer than that because that's obviously self-explanatory. I think really um, Pat Tillman, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was a American football player who ended up dying um, in Afghanistan. And he actually lived in Chandler, Arizona when he was alive and that's where I lived. And so just his, almost you could just feel Pat uh, in the streets of Arizona. And he was always someone that I looked up to, not necessarily, um, you know, obviously he's a great athlete, but he was just such a well-rounded person. And obviously he gave the ultimate for his country. And, um, with my brain injury, I don't think I would be able to go into, into military. Um, and that's not necessarily a passion of mine, but I never really pursued it. Um, and, but I have family who have served and, I just put that at, at, at the highest. Obviously, I love to run for Canada on the world stage. And that's, you know, as close as I'm ever going to get to representing my country. And so, yeah, Pat was definitely one of them. And I think uh, my siblings have always been a huge motivator for me. Um, I have four, four younger siblings, um, two brothers and two sisters. And I've always wanted to be the best big brother that I possibly can be. And um, selfishly, they're the most important people to me in my life. Um, they are extremely, extremely important to me. And so I wanted to be a great role model for them. And so if I was telling them to go chase their dreams or uh, when, when adversity hits to really run through that wall and really lean forward during that time. But if I wasn't doing that, then what type of brother would I be? And so I think those were more of the things that motivated me. And Pat was more the stuff if I was training and I was, you know, hurting bad, I would think about Pat. Um, and so that's kind of the two distinctions of my motivation. As an athlete now in track and field, do you still take characteristics of Pat and his journey and his motivation to you while you are on the track and field event? Yeah, definitely. I think he stood for something that was bigger, bigger than himself. And the Paralympic movement is bigger than me and it will always be bigger than me and I always look at it as I didn't really know what the Paralympic movement was until I was 23 years old which was you know unfortunate but fortunate I think unfortunate because I would have loved to have that experience but fortunate because I had the run against Olympic stream and able body athletes my entire life and I learned how to compete and I had a D1 scholarship uh, I was all conference we won a couple conference titles as team and so, yeah, I, I think it, it, it really taught me. But I also want, if something ever happened to my siblings or one of my friends, I want them to have the opportunity to play sport. It doesn't have to be high-performance sport, but it has to be sport. I think Kobe Bryant says it the best. Uh, sport is the best me metaphor for life, and I truly believe that. And, yeah, and Kobe's another one who uh, I – uh, look up to tremendously and more for the things he did for female sport after his career obviously mama mentality he was amazing while while he played but always really respected what he did for women in sport and female in sport and 
Um, that's something that I would love to do for the para Paralympic movement. And I will compete until 2024 and then I will hang up my spikes and I will hopefully be either in broadcast or just behind the scenes helping Paralympic athletes in the Paralympic movement. You mentioned earlier that after you got out of the hospital, it was kind of hard with finding your identity in a way. When did you finally find your identity and feel comfortable being around people or finding that next goal to accomplish? Yeah, I found running and I found it pretty quick, like pretty quick, but I didn't really realize until about eighth grade um, how good I was or that this could be a possible avenue for something. Um, and yeah, so in eighth grade, I wouldn't say I found my identity, but I put my identity as a runner. And then later in my life, really until I was 23, I really was, I wouldn't say lost, but just trying to figure things out, kind of on, this, on the seam of my pants kind of. And then I really figured out like, obviously there's someone my parents want me to be. There's who I wish I was and there's actually who I am. And I've really finally figured that out and uh, things that I truly like. Like I love speaking on behalf of Paralympic athletes. I love having great conversations with great people. And, um, you know, I'm a very, I'm a pretty blunt person, uh, similar to my, to my mother. Um, but I also, um, you know, love a lot of people, but um, I have people that I'm really close with and I'm really comfortable with them and I keep them really close. And I, I'm not someone who branches out to find new friends all the time. Um, you know, that's, it's just, I really trust the people who have been there, obviously in my time in need after my injury, um, but also times when I've struggled and, you know, we all, we all struggle. And I think, uh, yeah, I think we, we all go through hard things and we've, we've all been through a tough stretch or a tough road. And um, yeah. And so I, I just really try to keep those people close. I think the great thing that you mentioned is when you're taking on a challenge or something, you kind of do a lot of analyzing in how can you help other people and not take that road where it's all about you in a way. How you, when you're talking about the Paralympic athletes, you want to do what's best for the greater good of Paralympic athletes and do something that can bring an outreach to them. And it just shows in your characteristics about the passion that you have for the things that you enjoyed doing what event were you focused on what event were you more of a short distance or a long distance kind of athlete yeah I'm more of a middle distance so I'm kind of right in the middle uh to to be fully honest I think it's an interesting dynamic because my parents are very explosive athletes and I wouldn't I definitely wouldn't characterize myself as an explosive athlete <laughs> Uh, that's for sure. But I still have a little bit of speed. I maybe have a little bit more natural speed than your typical 1500 meter runner. Um, so I run the 1500, which is almost a mile, about 100 meters and a little bit uh, short of a mile. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm right in, uh, right in that sweet spot. And my coach is, um, I'm raising that 3k in a week. So I'm slowly moving my way up. Uh, the 1500 is going to be my event, but really in the 15, it's so much aerobic, so much endurance, not as much speed. So you really need to work on that 3K, 5K shape and paces to uh, get, you know, my ultimate goal is to win the Paralympic uh, gold medal in 2021 and set a world record. And so that's just the way I'm, I'm going after it. And, you know, I'm someone who likes to say my goal, but almost I say it to forget it, to be to be fully honest with you, uh, I really like to be, be present, focus on the actual day, because at the end of the day, if you stress about the, your angle, then you're never going to get there because then you won't actually pay attention to the finer or little details that actually need to get you there. Just when you're saying like 1500 meters, I'm like, after one lap, I'm tired. Like, I just don't want to run anymore. And then I see your post and you're showing like how much you've run. I'm like, I'm just tired just looking at it. Like I am, I've never been a person that likes running. Even like when school, like they made you run a mile. I'm like, can I skip this? Can, can we go do something else? I'm like, can we play an activity? But I think it's something that challenges you as a person. I mean, definitely for me, 
it's like, I always try to find, like we mentioned earlier, prove people wrong. And I think having that identity where I can't do something, I'm going to go do it. So you never know. You might see me running 1,500 meters soon. I doubt it, but awesome. it's too cold right now. Awesome. Right. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. I think one thing that is interesting about why I love running so much is because everyone thinks that's like this physical challenge, but it's honestly a more of a mental challenge for me. It's because your brain gets to a point where it tells you to stop and you have to override and say, no, I'm not stopping. I'm going to keep on going. And so that's one thing that I've just grown to really love because the brain is so fascinating. Obviously as someone who has a hole in their head, I always concern was concerned about my intellectual part, um, you know, how, how will I be when I get older? And so uh, I'd like to stay mentally sharp. And that's, that's one thing that running really has done for me. And uh, I'm just so lucky. And there's also a mindfulness part of running as well. It's uh, relax fast running is the fastest running that you'll ever do. If you're tense, uh, you're just simply not going to run fast. And so that's something that unfortunately took me about 23 years to learn uh my new coach heather henninger who i've been under for about two years a little bit over two years uh she was the world championship finalist and went to the world championships and so yeah that's something that she's really taught me and it's just funny how different coaches along the way teach you such different things they're all tools in your toolkit but uh, and you pull them at different times but yeah she's been super and influential and in getting me from a good runner to really being on that world stage and being able to compete and uh, doing what I uh, want to do. So what was next after growing up? Did you go to college? Were you able to pursue something or was track and field just that thing that you're focused on? Yeah, so I graduated from South Alabama University and. 2017. I went to Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina, ran two years there. Um, it was a great experience. Uh, I, I was looking for different opportunities that the coaching staff just couldn't give me at that time. And I, I was just wanting, yeah, just more opportunities to race. And so I decided to go to South Alabama. But honestly, I, I'm so thankful for the coaches there. They, they, they allowed me to really prosper when I was there. And I it's probably some of my best running I've done in a long time until last year. Um, I, I was really successful there. And then I went to South Alabama, got my degree in communications. I love to obviously in your intro, I love to public speak. And honestly, I just love to learn. I just love to have like really good conversations. And so I've always been super interested in entrepreneurship and just business. My stepdad, who's probably one of my biggest mentors, uh, not probably, he is my biggest mentor beside my mom and he's always been a businessman and um, so I just recently started my own clothing line Grey Wolf Men Mentality and that's something that I'm so green with oh my goodness uh, I'm learning all the things about Shopify and Instagram and uh, as you've seen I'm really I'm really active on social media and so that's something that I'm also really learning because I love I love Gary V as many people do uh, and I'm, I really follow his content and try to actually listen to, to what he says and so yeah it's been, a, been an interesting journey I'm not someone who more shares my more intimate thoughts and uh, things to my mentality and things like that but become a lot more open with that and um, I'm really an open book just a lot of people hadn't asked until recently and so that's something that uh, I've been quite quite busy doing. What was an achievement that you're able to accomplish during your college days that you kind of have like personal enjoyment for? Can you say that again? You, you froze a little bit. What was like, what was a personal achievement you had during your college days that is kind of a personal enjoyment that you will remember? Absolutely. It was indoors. It was my senior year. Um, it was, yeah, I think it was, February, I ended up finishing top three in the conference indoor mile, which was my first time ever finishing individually uh, in all conference top three position. And my mom was there. And my, my mom is, I don't know what the right word is, uh, constructive usually with me. Uh, she's just very honest with me. Like she, she never uh, says you do good when you did bad or that you did bad when you did good. She just 
honest with you. And she said, I've never seen you run like that ever. I've never seen you run with that confidence. Uh, and so, yeah, that was just really cool to hear her. And I felt that way coming off the track and it was cool getting that from, from her and then got it from my coach. And I think why it's so special is I actually bounced my head off a sidewalk a couple of weeks or a couple of months later after that. And I was running my best ever. And I had to take three weeks off obviously because I have a tra traumatic brain injury. I, it was, a, I ended up, running a uh, season's best and I just felt really sick after. So I, I went to bed and we had practice the next morning, didn't eat, had some stomach medication. I had just passed out of practice. Um, and that's what happened. And it kind of just, uh, I wouldn't say ruined my, the rest of my season, but I just didn't run well. And that's more on me. That's not on anyone else. I, I just uh, didn't, uh, didn't have the ability to execute the race plan the way that I wanted to. And uh, I think that time taught me a lot, but, uh, yeah, it was a rough end to my college career, but it was nice to have that all conference finish in uh, my back pocket, so to say. Are you someone that when you're looking at like best times, best laps, that if you don't reach that goal, you're down on yourself or do you kind of just use it as motivation to get better? Uh, I used to be like, that like down about it but now honestly i don't even care to be fully honest with you like if it doesn't like i i always say uh, i only get up about nationals and the para paralympics anything in between that i'm just training at, at the end of the day uh it doesn't i only now i only grade myself on how do i prepare for practice I mean, what does that mean do i show up before practice not on time but do i show up before do i foam roll do i do my activation um, and i just have so many amazing resources and so if i'm not doing everything that i can uh then that's um that's the only time that i'll be constructive towards myself uh but yeah training wise i just i kind of just go with the flow um to, to be fully honest with you i'm someone who meditates and like i said my like running is such a mindfulness and meditative state for me. Um, and so I, I really just enjoy running. I mean, it's such a relaxing part. And a lot of times I won't, I'll have my watch on, but I'll split it at the 400 mark, but like, I won't check it during, during the lap. Like I'm just, I'm so focused on, there's so much thing to be being in the flow. And if you think you're in the flow, then you're out of the flow. And so it's, it's something that's, it's such a thin line. And it's, that's, what high performance is to me is, you know, really finding that space where I'm at my best. And uh, I found getting mad at myself, but uh, funny enough, does not help that. So uh, I've kind of learned how to throw that out. So after college, what was that next path for you? Yeah. So uh, my last race in college, I finished dead last in the final. Very, very frustrating. My Former stepmom, she was my stepmom at the time, or another influential person in my life. Um, yeah, she she drove out to Texas to watch me race, and I just, man, I sucked. Just horrible. And I was a bit deflated for sure. Um, I packed up my stuff, graduated, drove back home to Georgia where my, my mom and stepdad live now. And my stepdad actually had cancer at, at the time. And so I was helping out on the days when he would get treatment, uh, being driving kids around. And I was working at a local uh, Fleet Feet in Atlanta, owned by Joe Braley. And so, yeah, that was something that I was doing. And then my mom kind of put the bug in my head about the Paralympics and really made to decide what country am I going to run for, um, which was interesting. And her mother died when I was really young. And uh, my grandpa played in the NHL, uh, played with Wayne Gretzky. And Bobby Orr. And so it, it was really important for me seeing how important Canada was to him. And I really wanted that pride for the flag of Canada. And my mom did so much for me. And it was almost like a thank you uh, to her. And honestly, I, I always loved Canada. And so it was a great, a great home for me. And it was a place where I could be in Olympic stream and Paralympic stream, because at the end of the day, trying to be the best that I can but I got classified in I think it was June 2018 and then uh, three weeks later I set the world record in Germany in the eight and the 15 and then I just felt like I got thrown in the bright the bright lights and 
man, I was in Belgium. I was in Switzerland. I was all over the world. It was uh, pretty crazy. Were you a type of person that liked traveling or was this like an experience that was worth it at the time to be able to travel all over the world? Yeah, for sure. I love traveling. I don't like customs. Customs <laughs> always drives me nuts because I'm a dual citizen and sometimes it just the customs officers just can't understand what a dual citizenship means. And it's just, sometimes it's like, well, you were born in Fresno, California, but you're Canadian. I was like, yes, I'm a Canadian citizen. So it's, it sometimes it was a bit frustrating, but, oh man, I had so much fun. Like it, I saw, like we had a training camp for three weeks in St. Moritz, Switzerland, up in the Swiss Alps with the best runners in the world. We're all up there and Sam Parsons and Craig Ingalls. Craig Ingalls has the, uh, trademark mullet and mustache and uh sam sam is uh one of the uh, founders of the 10 10 man elite crew and they're very very popular great guys within the uh running movement and so it was really cool to meet them and uh you know they're not you know they seem like such big characters but they're all they're just really down to earth and love to have a good laugh and so it was cool just to meet different people and understand how different people trained and uh just really and then becoming passionate for broadcast and just media in general uh, and that's kind of traveling and being world worldly uh, that kind of brought that into my life that uh, that could be a profession after running did you have to make the move to canada to train full-time there or were you able to go back and forth from the united states to canada so i guess i kind of skipped but before it was christmas in 2017 I decided to move to Arizona because just Georgia's weather during the winter is like, you just don't know what it's going to be. It's just like, it could be really hot. It could be cold, rainy. And so it's just really hard to do speed work because I have a bad hamstring, right? Because my right side is the side that got paralyzed. So I overused my left side. And so I just kept pulling it and it would just be pretty aggravating. So I wanted to go back to my, where I consider my home state uh, to just go live there and, and then when I decided to compete for Canada, I'm someone that wants to be authentic with everything I do. And I couldn't be authentic with the Canadian public saying how Canadian I am if I didn't live there and I didn't actually know what the culture was. Because I visited Canada for like my grandpa every, every summer almost growing up, but um, not being a citizen, I felt uh, was not authentic. And like I said, character is really important. And that's it wasn't the right character and it ended up being the best decision I've ever made. I live in on Vancouver Island in Victoria, like one of the most beautiful places in the world. And fortunately, actually during COVID, I like get barely any COVID cases on the entire Island. So it's ended up being like one of the best places to be because we're, yeah, I think a 90 minute ferry from Vancouver to actually get to Vancouver Island. So we're already uh, separated. So, uh, and that, and that way ended up being a blessing. And of course, many other ways. I train at the hub. It's called the West Hub uh, with Athletics Canada. They, I mean, should, we have everything you could ever want. Uh, our own track, like point one from my front door, uh, f physiologist, treatment, gym. It's just like, man, I'm so spoiled. It's, it's uh, pretty unbelievable. It's like a paradise island right there in front of you. Yeah, I know. Rough life, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, when you said, like, basically you have to travel and you're kind of, like, secluded, I'm like, well, I wish the United States was like that, but nope, you can't say that. <laughs> that's right, that's right. What's your biggest achievement representing Team Canada? I guess it would have to be winning the world title in 2019. I think it was an interesting dynamic at the time. I don't know what the, not respect, but everyone told me there's this athlete called Michael McKillop and, and everyone was telling me how I couldn't beat him. He'd won nine world titles and four Paralympic titles undefeated, never lost in Paral Paralympic racing. And so, yeah, it was a stressful time. I didn't race the last day, the last event, the last day. So we were in Dubai for almost three and a half weeks. And I was just sitting around and I then actually just ended up, uh, I broke up with my girlfriend and she was on the team and it was just, uh, it was a challenging time for sure. Um, I'm thankful for that time because it really, it definitely helped me mature for sure. 
uh, during that time. But yeah, I think that was probably the most uh, athletic wise, the most thing I'm, I'm proud of. Um, I, I think I remember coming around the track and hugging my coach Heather and that was one of my most proud moments. It was almost like a, a, culmula- a, a culmination of everyone who's ever done something for me in that hug, like within that brace, it was like, man, like I deserve 1% of the credit and my whole team deserves 99% of the credit because man, uh, I always tease my girlfriend. I was like, it ain't easy to put up with me. So like, I can't, I, I can't imagine what it took. And yeah, I just, I just feel like you're never alone, uh, truly alone in that there's always someone looking out for you or in my case, many people looking out for me. And so that was, you know, my thing was like, I need to find a team around me. And fortunately uh, I have a lot of family members uh, around me, which is super awesome. Uh, and uh, like, if you want to talk about some of them, I'm more than happy, but yeah, it's uh, it's, I have a pretty dang good team. That's for sure. I just read a quote and it was, it was all about, there's more people there to support you than more people to hate you or stop you. And it kind of just shows where, and anything we do, it can be in sports, business, uh, an activity, you're going to, you'll have those people that are going to support you. And that support gives you that energy to go out there and compete in a way or go and reach your goals. And I think a lot of people kind of forget those people and they kind of think, oh, well, I was the only one that did it. I was the only one that was able to win. And it kind of just shows in both of us that we know that we have those people that are behind us every step of the way. And we, we appreciate those people in our lives. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I have so many, so many great, great, great people and I'm definitely a jokester. So it's cool to have the different varieties of people surrounding you. And there's people along my journey who I've met like Blake Griffin, who I was like, wow, it's pretty crazy that I'm, I've become friends with Blake and uh, it's like super weird and great, but it's just really cool to be surrounded by different high performers and pick in their ear, their brain, uh, what they've been through and what they learned from those super, those similar scenarios. And especially coming from different backgrounds, it's really cool to see people succeed with different beliefs within their mindset. And so that's something I've always been super intrigued with. As the big brother to your siblings, and as you're winning that medal, were they all happy for you, waiting for you to come home? Or did you kind of have to like call them right away and say, look what I just did? Uh, no, I had. I remember when I got back to my phone, I was like, man, this is crazy. I didn't think, I mean, like it, was, it was really cool to win, but I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, it's just another race and and not like, yeah, it was really, really cool, but it was just cool to see how proud my mom was and my stepdad. And then, yeah, all my little sibs were, were, uh, my brother Benji, who's 17, just committed to Sac State to play baseball. He is a very, very funny character. And I had a very funny text with a lot of capital letters (laughs) in it. And just like, so, so proud of you, bro. Like, gosh that's so awesome and I, de- I definitely was on his story and uh it's 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 pretty funny when your brother's 17 and he still wants to talk about his brother it's uh something that i'm you know super very very lucky um, to have and i actually right after i went to london england to visit my uncle brad and then i flew to see one of my sisters my stepmom my biological dad and then, then i flew home uh where i where i would consider uh, home to you know to Georgia where my family lives now and then was there for a month and got to see all of them crazies and uh, one kind of like I said I'm a jokester and my family's uh, likes to have a good time and uh, we sat down to watch my race together my mom goes I can't believe they gave you a medal for running that slow and we all just like, bursted like burst and laughing and like we're all like, getting each other high fives and like looking at mom like hey, I can't believe you just said that but it was also super funny uh so yeah it was uh it was really cool to kind of have almost like a homecoming and everyone um yeah everyone being so proud and my stepdad is a fantastic cook 
So he made homemade chicken wings uh, the night I came home and had his fryer out. And I was like, man, this is all right. It was almost like a cheat day for you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was taking my two weeks off. So I was like, man, you know, all the food. Like, I'm someone who, obviously, professional athlete on the track, but I know how to professionally get out of shape so fast. I am so good at it. I'm a big donut. Oh, I love donuts so much. And when my past two weeks off, I went to visit my girlfriend. She lives in on the mainland right outside of Vancouver. And I had so many donuts. She worked out at this coffee shop, and I, oh, man. I ate uh, more donuts than I, than I cared to admit, that's for sure. Earlier when we were talking, you mentioned that 2024 was going to be your last Olympics. Why do you feel that is your last Olympics? Yeah, I've just been in the sport since I was basically born, and I just think it's time. You know, I think money's always a tough thing when you're, quote-unquote, an amateur athlete, as they characterize us track and field athletes. Um, so yeah, that's tough for sure. And Paralympic athletes make even less, right? Uh, so that's that's frustrating at times. But at the end of the day, like there's more things I want to do in life than run on a track and turn left. I mean, there's <laughs> I have a lot of life goals, not just actually track goals. And I've just been so fortunate, you know, to do what I've done for you know so long and stay stayed somewhat healthy and experience what I've experienced and yeah I just think it's time to uh, turn the page in the story of my life and move on and uh, you know hopefully uh, start a family sometime and uh, yeah and just get a job like get a consistent job that um, I feel like I'm making an impact and um, that's not something that like I'm fine if I don't feel like I'm making an impact for 10 years like at the end of the day I just want to know that uh, I don't care if my name is uh, next to my impact as long as just deep down, I know that I've made a 0.1% uh, difference and um, allow Paralympic athletes to have more opportunities than we have today. Like today, especially with my disability, our class, it's very tough because a lot of people see my Instagram and they're like, oh, there's, you don't have a disability. What are you talking about? Well, I have a hole in my head and I, ha I don't use my right side how normal human beings right side works. And so it's, it's, it's different when you have an invisible disability, but at the same time, my disability has never defined me and it never will. Um, and so it's fun if people say that, because at the end of the day, like it doesn't really bug me. I mean, sure, it can be frustrating at times, but at the end of the day, like if people hate on me for that, then I almost like have gratitude for them. Like they must be going through something really bad that they take the time out of their day to say something to me about my disability where it's clearly documented that I got paralyzed and I had a hole in my head that I had internal bleeding. I thought I could have possibly died if the internal bleeding didn't stop or they would have to do surgery, then I would be a vegetable for the rest of my life. So um, at the end of the day, I think that's, that's something with maturity that you learn how to navigate. And it's, uh, it's not very easy, um, especially with social media. Um, obviously, you know, it's as many people know, it's not a, it's not easy and I'm not going to make it like I'm a super celebrity because I'm definitely not nothing close. Um, but yeah, so it's been an interesting uh, endeavor to navigate that, but it's also been fun. As myself, as a, have a disability with being a diabetic and not having an a organ working, I think having people define you as that, I think it kind of, for me, it's like, well, okay, I just have this thing going on, but I'm still the normal Alex that you know. And I think when people say, oh, you're different because of that, I'm the same person. I don't know what they're seeing, but I just try to bring the positive in any of the situations from the times that I've had medical issues. I try to learn from those opportunities and get better and better. And I think for us, especially with you, you're showing that a disability is not going to stop you from accomplishing, accomplishing what you want to do in a way. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I made the semifinal at the Olympic Stream uh, National Championships in Canada. So that's, you know, I definitely don't uh, shy away from that. And sometimes, and sometimes it's just good to get your butt whooped, to be fully honest with you. Like uh, in the Paralympic, I've been undefeated and 
So, I mean, it's easy to get my butt whooped when it comes to the Olympic stream athletes. And they're all, a lot of them are my good friends. And But sometimes it's, you know, uh, you need to fail at times. And I think that's one time, one thing throughout my life is that when people tell you how amazing your injury is or how amazing that recovery is, it's sometimes you need to like weave your way through the bull crap and actually like, what's what I need to work on? Because at the end of the day, like that's great that I recovered and it's really cool, but I need to keep on evolving as an athlete, as a person to get better, uh, you know, just to be good for myself, my family, my brothers, you know, future wife and just things like that. That's, you know, really important to me. Um, and so, yeah, I think sometimes, you know, it's uh, surprisingly uh, difficult hearing about uh, how cool my injury is or how whatever way you want to put it. At the end of the day, it happened. I recovered. Now I'm trying to make the best life that I know how and trying to be uh, successful in my definition of being su 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 successful. So that's just uh, what I try to do. You talked about your apparel brand that you started. What is next? What are you hoping to accomplish with that apparel brand? And have you felt that your brand as an athlete has helped you grow that business in a way? Yeah, so I literally just started it. So it might be too early to say about my brand. Uh, definitely my, uh, we d had a lot of uh, orders the first the first week or so, which was really cool. Really was thankful of that. And I think, uh, like I said, it's coined Grey Wolf Mentality. And I made a document actually called Grey Wolf Mentality that has six pillars of uh, four things that have um of, that I live my life by and then two things that have made me into who I am today and so I, I wanted to more be it came out of mama mentality how it's a way of life and that's how it is for me it's a way of life I think so many times in the business world we just focus on money um, but at the end of the day we don't focus as much on people as we should and I just want people who look different or act different or have a disability or uh lose a parent or just like go through tough times that um, if you do lean through your adversity, uh, you can really come out on the other side better. And it's hard. Like when you get paralyzed, you go through this adversity. It's, it doesn't seem like there's going to be something better on the other side. It's so crappy going to it. But at the end of the day, having perspective, having gratitude are two things that I've learned that just are so amazing. And uh, at the end of the day, like there's people who, going through things a lot worse than you especially with me like yeah COVID has sucked but at the end of the day there's people who have losing family members and um them themselves are getting sick and I haven't received or I haven't got COVID yet which obviously so thankful for no of my family that I know of has had has had COVID and so at the end of the day like I'm just thankful that my parents and my family are healthy and so I just think that's one thing that my injury really taught me was to have perspective. And that's what I hope my brand, uh, you know, can bring to people is, um, you know, to be fierce, but also uh, be well-rounded and uh, not just an athlete. Uh, you know, the LeBron James uh, coin term more than an athlete uh, is really important to me. And I know uh, hundreds of my counterparts. As a fellow podcaster, what made you want to start that? Yeah, absolutely. I think I was complaining that us Paralympic athletes did not get the media coverage that the Olympic athletes have. And I found I, I found myself complaining about that. And I'm like, Nate, who cares if you're complaining? Like, if you're not doing anything about it, then shut up. Um, and so I was like, all right, I love to talk to people. I love to share people's journeys. I want to talk to Olympic and Paralympic because if I stunt the growth of my podcast, then that's dumb. Um, and I selfishly want to learn. And I think that was like the big thing that was like uh, hitting the nail on the head was like, I just want to learn. And I've just got to talk to so many amazing people from Aaron Brown. I just interviewed uh, Maddie Price the other day, which or yesterday, and she's so awesome. And we talked about patience, which is where that post came from earlier today. And just really hearing her story and how she came up. And it's really funny. There's so many similarities. We're both born in California and uh, both went to schools really, really close to each other. So yeah, it's really cool how your stories slash journeys are intertwined, but how they're not intertwined at all. 
uh, it's just really interesting to kind of hear people's journeys. I think it's just really interesting. You can learn from, it doesn't matter who it is. I think that's what I enjoy about this show and doing it. It's like, I've been able to talk to people all over the world um, and people from different industries, different backgrounds, different experience. And the one thing is I can learn something from each interview I do. Even if I already knew something about me, I always learn something new and then I enjoy and I take from it. Because everyone maybe goes through similar situations or different experiences, but we're not a show that tells you how to live your life. We're just giving you our experience and how we were able to rise to the challenge as we are each and every day. So I see the similarities with our shows and your show is doing great. I, I enjoy it personally because learn something new about people and athletes and individuals that maybe I've never heard of. And this is a great way to find out more about the community that you are involved in. Yeah, no, it's, it's so, so cool. And it's so fun. Like you may know something, but sometimes someone says it a different way and it strikes a chord with you in just such a different way. Um, I, I just talked to Noah who I posted today and it was super, super interesting. Like he talked about his learning disability and how he wants, how he was a valedictorian number one. I was like, what? Like, that's crazy. And how he just doesn't let his learning disability cap him. Like he's a, he works at, he worked at Apple. Yeah. Like I said, he's the val, the valedictorian of his high school. And yeah, he's just never let that define him. And I knew that because I believe in that. But the way he said it gave me goosebumps and then made me journal about it and made me meditate about it and be like, hmm, what can I take from that? Well, this ability is an inability. It's so true. Um, Dr. O, who's out of Michigan, um, kind of coined that term, at least the first time I heard that term. And it's just so true. Uh, it doesn't matter. And disability doesn't have to be like physical or mental. Like it, it can just be something that's handicapping you in your life. It can be that some someone passed away and it's just like you can't get through it right you, you know it's uh you know it, it's just so tough and it's really cool to hear perspective because i just think sometimes you can just learn learn from someone else and just they just may say it's slightly different and it could just be all of the difference for you i totally agree the just hearing it from a different perspective it kind of just it shows that everyone may be going through similar things, but we could all encourage and be there for each other in a positive way and grow as a group. Yeah, it's so true. And uh, yeah, I wish I thought of the idea earlier and I, more, I wish I committed to the idea earlier because I've had it for three or four years. I mean, it's so easy to make a podcast, right? Like you can get fancy. I've definitely gotten a thing or two um, for sure. Got a nice microphone, got a nice light and, just some i love to cut video so i love to share my perspectives and other people's perspectives so i definitely enjoy creating content that's probably my favorite thing to do is just creating content uh, i spend a lot of my day doing that when i'm not training uh, or talking to my girlfriend i'm creating content that's for sure you're basically working from 6 a.m to like 9 p.m all day <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so what does the future look like for you? What are you hoping to accomplish in the next few years, personally and professionally? Yeah, professionally, I hope to be a uh, defending Par 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 Paralympic champion. I mean, I think that would be really cool. I mean, that's why I want to go to 2024, because if I win gold at the Par Paralympics, I'm going to want to defend it. And if I don't win, then I'm going to want to try to get it. So that gives me uh, two chances. Uh, Paralympic glory if, if that's how you want to put it um, but at the end of the day like the medals and all that don't mean that much to me um, really it's the people you're on on your journey with and memories are just so important to me and just I remember especially during COVID like there's days where I would just wake up and sort of laughing like thinking of when me and my uh, training partners Tom were in St. Moritz, Switzerland and he thought he talked Swiss German so he would say laugh and toff and off and toff and then to like people as like they're they're walking by and I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> this is like I don't know him, number one, and number two, that is funny. Um and so just like those memories where you're just being goofballs and just experiencing life and you know, just having fun. Personally, I just wanna be the best brother that I can and be the best, you know, uh, son or whoever 
uh, you know, there's so many different titles uh, that, so many different hats that we all wear. Uh, so yeah, I just want to continue uh, really growing that and growing my personal brand. I really enjoyed, enjoy doing that like we just talked about. And so I'd love to continue growing that and uh, just really hopefully my podcast can, can grow. I mean, sure, I would love to do it where it makes some money, but at the end of the day, I didn't do it in the first place to make money. I did it to tell people's stories. So if it never makes a dime in its uh, life, I'm fine with that. Uh, I, you know, I chose people over money in that instance. And I've just had so, it's been so fulfilling. And so I hope I can just keep doing things that are really fulfilling. Uh, and I see myself staying in Canada, to be fully honest with you. Um, so I've kind of built a tribe here in Canada and I've, I've really enjoyed all the rest the relationships that I've, uh, uh, you know, kept and that I've made. And so, yeah, I'm just really interested in seeing where the journey takes me, but who knows, I could be living in Europe in six or seven years. So, um, I'm more of the, I'm, I'm more of the adventure type. Like I went to South Alabama when I knew no one, I moved to Arizona when almost all my friends were gone, moved up to Victoria where I didn't know anyone to a completely different country. I thought the culture was the same. It's not the same. Uh, it's very different socialist country for sure. Um, or socialist culture to some sort. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, um, that's just kind of been how I've lived my life. It seems like. For someone that's listening to this interview based on your journey and experience, what tips or advice would you give them to overcome their obstacles, accomplish their goals and rise to their challenge? That's a really good question. Um, a million things come to my head, <laughs> um, fortunately and un unfortunately. But I think uh, choose your why. Figure out why you're doing something or why you want to achieve something. I think it's so important. I th that component of believing in something that's bigger than yourself, I think that really helps you get out the door better. And every day, and uh, like we've, I think, a theme of this conversation is build a team or inner circle, whatever phrase that you like, and build that with people who, you know, mean a lot to you. And they're a good friend to you. Like, hey, if, if they're not good for you, kick them out of that inner circle. Like, don't, you don't have to do it uh, maliciously or rudely, but they need to leave because at the end of the day, uh, you know, if they're making you more insecure, that is not, you know, a good place to be. And thirdly would be whatever you're passionate about, go, go, go chase that. And, um, you know, so far I feel like I've never worked a day in my life. I mean, I've worked at the running store, worked, I interned at my uh, stepdad's former company. And then I've been a professional athlete for the last two years. And it's all, all been things I've been super passionate about. Um, and uh, if you have the opportunity to travel the world or play sports in college, please do it because that opportunity will not always be there, especially playing sports in college, uh, especially the NCAA. I know there's some drama going down with the NCAA, but if you have the opportunity to play college sports, that's some of the coolest moments I ever had. It's just you get to do this for four years and who knows, you can get a real job after that. But I would really push kids, even if it's D3 or NAIA, go play uh, in college because you you create so many And sport, like we said, is a sport for life. And so you will learn so many things that honestly that you really can't or it will take a long time for you to be in the real world. Because you don't, in the real world, you don't want to be in situations where you're that nervous all the time, or it's like where your fight or flight is like going crazy. Um, and, but in sports, you can do that. And my stepdad always said, I will always hire an athlete um, before I will hire a non-athlete. And so I think um, ha being able to have that time management, you know, is uh, really important, especially in the business world. Well, Nathan, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show to talk about your rise to the challenge. Your story has been inspiring to so many people, and we're excited to see what the future looks like for you. Yeah, of course. Of course. And if uh, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to follow me, it's uh, Nate Graywolf on Instagram. And uh, all of my handles on Twitter and all that are all the same thing. So, um, and if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always always love talking to people and doesn't matter if it's a funny conversation or a serious conversation.